worship. We're so glad that you're here with us today. Wherever you are, God is present. God is with us here in this space, and God is with you wherever you are. As we come before God in worship, we recognize God's love and forgiveness, and we respond to that in our life through worship. There are some wonderful things happening in the life of our church that we want to make you aware of. On October 9th, our next-gen students are meeting at the Oldendorf's house for a hike. We're going to take an easy hike, and then we're going to stuff our faces with s'mores and barbecue. You can sign up on our church events page. Our chancel choir is also participating in the 13th annual multi-faith choral concert at St. Paul's Episcopal Church on October 16th at 5 p.m. This concert benefits Life Moves. And if you're watching this on Sunday, September 25th, we are going to Ray Park right after worship. Join us at Ray Park for pizza and a good time. Ray Park has a playground where the kids can play and it's gonna be a fun day. Let us continue as we worship God.
Jeep Wrangler is a vehicle that acts like it's been there before. Whether it's rolling down Burlingame Avenue, conquering the rugged terrain of Big Sur, or taking a beach cruise through Half Moon Bay. More so than other models, this two-door Sahara adheres to its original design more than anything else on the road, which for Jeep purists is just the way they like it. When you're a search for a car that needs to make not only you look awesome, but also the second driver, your college-age daughter, the classic look of the Wrangler is one of the first to come to mind. That's why it was an easy choice for our next guest on Pastors and Cars, Ron Zaragoza. Ron is a true Jeeper and had the Jeep wave down as he pulled in to take me for a ride out to the Bay Trail. As I talked with Ron about his God story, I realized that he and I are a lot alike. We both love the beauty that's in the mystery of God's existence. Ron doesn't get tied in knots worrying about what he can see or what he can't see. And isn't that the real definition of faith after all? It's like that statement that's on every side view mirror. Objects in mirror are closer than they appear. Ron thinks about God in the exact same way. It doesn't matter if you think you can't see, can't touch, or can't name it. God's presence is there, and it's not up to us to explain how. And sometimes the more we get inside our own head, the more tied in those knots we can become. So here's what we know about Jeep owners. They're one of a kind, friendly, and they are a part of a community. I'd say that sums up Ron's car life and his spiritual life. Wouldn't you? Thank you, Ron Zaragoza, for that God story. Such a powerful testimony, and that's a very cool Jeep. Also, thank you, Stephen Hall. That took hours and hours of writing and work. We're so grateful for you. We have friends today at Sterling Court. We're so grateful for you, and we pray the Holy Spirit is with you in that space. I always like to talk about things that are happening in our church in an exciting way before we go to our message. And so you remember last week was the Queen's funeral, and I just have to make a confession. I did wake up at 3 a.m. to watch the Queen's funeral, and then I regretted it the rest of the day. However, uh, we, if you watched the funeral, you saw one of our previous associate pastors, Ken McKenzie, who was the Queen's private chaplain. He was a pastor in this church. So a lot of great pastors have come through this church through the years. Now here's something really amazing. Most of us have been praying for Fiona, the terrible hurricane in Puerto Rico. This is what happened and, and how our church has helped. So about four or five years ago, we raised about $30,000 for the country of Cameroon. Incredible, but we could not send the money to Cameroon because of the war that's happening. So our capable team decided to focus the money in Puerto Rico. And our leader, Todd Bauer at the time, decided that they would put $30,000 into solar panels for Puerto Rico. So this last week or so, the hurricane came through and most everything was decimated except for what in a small town? The solar panels that you helped to purchase. So the generosity of this congregation and Todd Bauer have made it possible for us to bless the, the country of Puerto Rico. So way to go. So we are on our series called Pastors in Cars Getting Coffee. And we wanted a fun way for us to talk about telling our God stories. And what are God stories? They're simply that. They're stories that involve God and us. And they can be short, they can be happy, they can be sad, they can be long, they can be poetic, but all of us have a God story. And over the past five weeks or so, or three weeks, but we have five reasons why you should tell your God story. The first is that the future of Christianity depends on you telling your story. From the year 33 AD to the year 300, Christianity grows from 12 poor fishermen to 6 million Christians. How does that happen? Only one way. You and me and people like you and me telling our God stories. We also said that telling your God story can be scary. And listen, it's even scary for me. And I've been doing this as a pastor for 22 years. It's scary to do it. We also talked about make, make sure you use your own words. Don't use religious language or the words of Billy Graham or Andy Stanley. Use your own words. And then last week, we talked about how our faith actually grows by telling our God stories. 
It's a way to grow our faith each time we tell our story. And then we talked about grief last week. And we said that grief can be a part of God's stories too. So today I want to talk about God's stories told through artistry or God's stories told through artistic expression. And I want to focus on somebody that you would not think of as particularly artistic. And I want to talk today about John the Baptist. Now, I don't know what you think about when you think of John the Baptist, but growing up, I always thought of a guy who was like a binary, black and white, hating, uh, sin-preaching fundamentalist. But John the Baptist, as I have studied him through the years, was an artist. Everything about John the Baptist was artistic. The things he said, the things he thought, the things he did. So today, as we begin talking about how to tell your God story through your artistic expression, I want you to think about what areas of your life you are artistic in and how God can use that to tell God's story. But first, let's pray. Thank you so much, God, that you speak to us, not just in words, but in your art, your creation. And God, you give us the chance to speak about you, not just with our words, but also with the artistic expression of our lives. And I'm praying, especially for the artists worshiping here today, that they would feel empowered by you to continue to do their art for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So I don't know about you, but I just love artists. I love the way they think. I love the way they process. I love the way they feel. I love the way they live. They're just amazing. A couple weeks ago, I got a chance to meet personally with an amazing man named Dale Perkins, who many of you know was a member of this church and an incredible, incredible artist. And I met with him just two days before he died. Now, Dale was always artistic. That's just who he was. And you can see his artistry in the rec center and in our church. But just before he went to heaven, I want you to know he was even more artistic than he had ever been before. And and I'll never forget sitting on the edge of his bed and him raising his finger, which was crooked with time and with age. And he, he painted a picture. He said, Graham, do you see, do you see that dog's head there? And I looked and, and I did see a dog's head. And, and then he said, Graham, do you see that cloud? And he painted a picture with a cloud. And, and I did see a cloud. And then he said, Graham, do you see that woman's face smiling at us? And I looked and I saw a woman's face. See, Dale could see things that other people couldn't see. God spoke to Dale in images, and he brought them out for the rest of all of us. Now, when we think of artistry, we don't just have to think of like painters. Anybody who thinks outside the box or goes against culture or against the norm or bends reality in some way is an artist. So there's thousands of forms of artwork. An artist, for example, who was one of the greatest baseball players of all time passed away this last week. His name was Maury Wills, and he happened to be my great uncle by marriage. I'm so proud of being connected to Maury Wills through marriage, but Maury Wills was one of the greatest base stealers of all time. He broke the record, the world record, for 104 bases stolen in one season, and he beat Ty Cobb, who only had 96. And there were only two other base stealers who beat him. One is Lou Brock, and another one was Ricky Henderson from the Oakland days. But I'll, I remember reading something about uh, base stealing from the New York Times that, that Maury said. He basically described base stealing as an art. He said, stealing is a matter of confidence, even conceit. It's more than getting a good jump, a big lead. It's being in the right frame of mind. I will run with the thought that the pitcher will make the perfect pitch and the catcher will make the perfect catch and that I will still beat them. I don't have a doubt. Now, now those are the words of an artist. So let's go to John the Baptist or John the artist. And let's keep both of these two artists in mind. Let's keep uh, Dale Perkins and Maury Wills and let's talk about John the artist. 
Here is five ways how John the Baptist was an artist. First, John invented the sacrament of baptism. This sacrament that we have is a central part of our faith. We have the baptismal font here. Most of us worshiping here today were baptized. You can thank John the Baptist for that. You see, before John the Baptist, there were these mikvah, kosher baths that people went through ritualistically, like you were taking a shower in the morning, no point, you barely thought about it, you just washed and then you got out. But, but John the Baptist, or John the artist, invented baptism. He said, no, baptism is going to be a thing that is like the Israelites coming through Egypt and out of Egypt, and through the wilderness, and through the waters, and come out clean on the other side. John the Baptist, or John the artist, was also artistic in a second way. He was extremely inclusive, and extremely um, inclusivity, excuse, I'm mixing my words there, but he included all kinds of people. Uh, You can see from uh, Matthew, it says that John the Baptist, or John the artist, invited all people to baptism. Women, men, prostitutes, tax collectors, Roman soldiers, murderers, all people were invited to baptism and to salvation. And again, not to turn this into a seminary class, but before John the Baptist, it was only men who could receive the, the sacrament of circumcision. But after that, women could be included. He was also an artist because he was a voice crying out from the wilderness. All artists, and again, if you're an artist today, know that you live a kind of wilderness experience. You go into your studio, you go into your music room, you go into your garden, you go into your kitchen, you go somewhere and you go into that wilderness moment and you bring something creative out of it. That was John the Baptist. The next way that John the Baptist, or John the artist, uh, was an artist was, I think, his dress. I mean, he was like the first conceptual artist of all time. I mean, here are three famous conceptual artists, John Baldessari, which who, by the way, doesn't he look a little like John the Baptist? Um, An Kawara, uh, Marina Abramovich, these are people who literally dressed the part of their artistry. John the Baptist dressed as an artist. He had a camel homespun cloth and a camel skin belt. And he, I mean, listen, if you saw John the Baptist at Lenardi's grocery store, you would either call call the cops or you would ask when his next art exhibit was. He just looked extremely artistic. But today what I want to focus on are John's beautiful words that are extremely artistic. And so let's listen for God's word. And this is coming, by the way, from the most artistic gospel, John. John talks about light and dark, and he is extremely artistic. He also writes Revelation, which is the most artistic book in the Bible. But let's listen for, let's listen for the artistry of John here. John 19, 1 through 14. So now this was John's testimony, or John's God story. When the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was, excuse me, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. Now a couple things here, if you ever know an artist or you are an artist, never ask them a direct question of who they are. They hate that question. They will back themselves into a corner, and that's exactly what John the artist does here. They ask him, who are you? Are you Elijah? And John gives these almost childlike answers, these juvenile answers. He says, I am not. It sounds like my 14-year-old, which we may take a moment to just say that a lot of our kids give these kind of rebellious answers. Maybe they're more artistic than we are. Well, let's go back to our text. Then they ask him, are you a prophet? And he gives them one word, no. Again, this is an artist. They hate to be defined. They hate to be put into a small box. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer so we can take it back. And again, as they keep coming to John, he keeps backing himself further. They keep coming at him. He feels more and more boxed in. What do you say about yourself? Now, here are these beautiful artistic words. John takes a moment 
And I like to think that he, he takes his finger and he looks at the heavens and he maybe says, I am the voice of the one calling out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Again, when John spoke, people scratched their head. They couldn't exactly figure out what he was saying, but he was saying something that was outside of this world. And they keep coming to, to John and they keep asking to define who he is. And, and then John said this of Jesus, when he sees Jesus, his cousin, who is the savior of the world, coming across the horizon. He doesn't say, hey, cuz, how's it going? He uses artistic language. Listen to this. Now, I want you to imagine Dale Perkins with his finger. He says, look, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And maybe as John the Baptist was painting this picture of Jesus with his finger, maybe all the people could see Jesus, the Messiah, for the first time. And and later he's asked about the Holy Spirit and he uses equally beautiful artistic language. He says, the Spirit comes down from heaven as a dove, and it remains on him. And by the way, this is one of the first incidents in the New Testament of the Holy Spirit being identified as a dove. Thank you, John. And I myself, he says, did not know him, but the one who sent him to baptize with water told me, the man to whom you will see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Again, as John would say these things, People would scratch their heads. They would know that they're true, but they wouldn't exactly know what to do with them. But they were powerful. In fact, Jesus has once asked, tell us about John the Baptist. And Jesus says of John, John, the artist, the Baptist, is the greatest human being ever born in the history of the world. Now, again, if you're an artist today, I want you to just to drink this in. Jesus is saying that the artist in John is the greatest person ever to live. So what do we do with this today as we're talking about our God stories, as we're talking about how to share our God stories through our artistry? Well, the first thing I think I just want to lift up is that a lot of great Christian themes come out of artistic expression. Now, here's the thing. Very many artists don't like to call themselves Christian because they're being boxed in. But trust me on this, they are. So I just want to share with you a couple of examples. One of my favorite books of all time is the book A River Runs Through It by Norman MacLean. If I could write like Norman MacLean, I would quit the ministry today. But here's some writing at the end of that beautiful story, and I just want you to hear the God story in these words. Norman writes this, Eventually all things merge into one, and a river runs through it. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops. Under the rocks are the words, and some of the words are theirs. I am haunted by waters. Now, my friends, do you not hear the book of Genesis through and through in Norman MacLean's writing? Another great book and movie with Christian themes by an artist, and it must be said probably not like your most stereotypical Christian, Stephen King. He writes Shawshank Redemption. Now, if there is a modern Christian novel and movie, it is Shawshank Redemption. It involves, as you remember, a guy named Andy DeFresny, and Andy is the Jesus figure in this. He is imprisoned falsely in a terrible prison named Shawshank, and Andy spends his whole time trying to set the prisoners free, and Andy actually escapes from prison, and as a biblical reference, one of the prison guards looks into the empty cell and says, my holy God. One of the ways that Andy uh, sets the prisoners free is through music, through faith. And he plays the beautiful music of Mozart over the speakers. And the, the security guards are irate. And he locks himself in this little room and he plays. But Red, who is played by Morgan Freeman, said this, I tell you, those voices soared. Higher and farther than anybody in a gray place dares to dream. 
It was like some beautiful bird flapping into our drab little cage and made these walls dissolve away for the briefest of moments. Every last man at Shawshank felt free. And then to cap off the biblical theme, Andy DeFresny actually escapes through prison. He escapes through a river of manure, a sewer. And one of the great lines is that Andy DeFresny crawled through the river of manure and came out clean on the other side. My friends, if that isn't the cross, then what is? That's what Jesus does on the cross. He, he crawls through a, a, a tunnel of manure to get, to get us free. This painting here is one of my favorite paintings. It is painted by a friend of mine named John Genrich, who lives in Colorado Springs. And the painting is called Light B. And it's based on this image from Genesis. The first words in Genesis are, let there be light. But actually, uh, the Hebrew is light B. And so this is my friend John Genrich, who paints this picture of creation. It's a little child holding a candle, and there's three candles around it, and it says, light be. Now, you won't find a child in the book of Genesis. You won't find a candle, but, but does that not capture the, the creation story almost better sometimes than the words that we're reading? And again, if we had the time today, we could go on and on. Uh, the music of you too. I'm packing a suitcase for a place that no one's been. Or the music of the fray, I found God on the corner first and I'm a star. There are so many examples of Christian expression in art. The second thing I just want us to think about is that you and I can be artists in the telling of our God stories. We don't have to use words. In fact, the great great saint, St. Francis of Assisi, once said, preach the gospel always and use words only when necessary. But here's some artists in our church, on our staff. Carrie Persichetti, incredible artist. She's created this beautiful sign out front that maybe you've seen. It's just welcoming the colors, the words, all the images she puts together for our series. She puts her artistic heart into. Each one of our staff members has artistry in their ministry, Sonu through her cooking, Cynthia through her crafting, Carolyn, our accountant, through her baking, Jim in the yard, Beth with prayers, Jane with the chapel, Stephen with his music, Casey with his technology. The list goes on and on. Third, I think Christians need to be more open-minded when it comes to artistic God stories. Now, if this was a seminary class, we could take an entire semester and focus on art and the Bible. Now, here's a hard bedrock fact. This book, the Bible, is a very artistic book. The most artistic of the entire book is probably the book of Revelation. And if you want the theological 50-cent word for this, this is what's known as apocalyptic imagery. But here, if, if this is an artistic language from John, what is? Revelations 12, a great sign appeared in the heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Now, Christianity goes through a phase of artistic and non-artistic phases. So one might argue the first century was somewhat artistic. Then we go through a very dark period, the dark ages. There's not a lot of art. But then the Renaissance comes along, and it's mostly because the church is paying for the art. But here's some paintings that you've heard of, incredible pieces of art. Pablo Veronese, The Wedding at Cana. Leonardo da Vinci, The Last Supper. Creation by Michelangelo. And the head of the Baptist by Bernardo Luini. Now let's pause on that last image because it makes my point even better than I could make it myself. What happened to John the artist? He was beheaded by an evil king. That's what happens to artists who are in the wilderness. And that's what shouldn't happen to artists. 
and I don't have the time to go into it today, but because the Reformation focused on the spoken word so much, and God bless it, God bless John Calvin and Luther and all of those folks, they tended to sideline the artistic word. All right, here's my last point for, for you today. God is the greatest artist that ever lived. God is going to speak to you this week sometime through God's art. And I'm pretty sure he may not be speaking to you in an actual word, although he may. When God separates the light from the dark, when he creates all things, God is the greatest artist there ever was. I want to close with this. Um, my son Ewan is just so amazing. And he, um, he said to me the other day, he came into the house and he said, Daddy, 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 Daddy. He said with a bright beaming face, I found God. And I was like, cool. Uh, where did you find him? Did you find him at like uh, Next Gen Ministries with Cynthia or Our Lady of Angels? No, he said, I found God on the trampoline. I said, cool, Wow. He said, you got to come, you've got to come, you've got to come, you've got to come see God. And so I said, all right, I'll come out. And so we went to the trampoline and I said, um, <clears throat> cool, where, where is God? He said, daddy, you've got to jump. You've got to jump to see God. So you and I jumped. He said, no, no, you've got to jump higher, much higher. You've got to jump. And so I jumped higher and he pointed to the horizon and he said, see, there's God. And he pointed out the most beautiful, incredible sunset I'd ever seen over the hills. He said, Daddy, we found God. And I said, yes, you did, Ewan. You found God. And what is God saying to you? And, and Ewan said, God's telling me he loves me. And I said, yes, that is God. That's God. And I said, you know what, Ewan? I think that you found God and God also found you. And so then I went inside and he came in about 10 minutes later and he said, I, I just told the neighbors that I found God. I was like, wow, a young evangelist. And then, and then I said, well, you know, what did the neighbors say? And he said, the neighbor said, oh. <laughs> I want to finish with one of my favorite worship songs of all time by Hillsong. It's about God speaking through God's artwork. I just am so moved by these words and I'm going to try to sing the chorus as we close. But it begins with those words. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time, with no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. And then it moves to this amazing chorus. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star, a signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. Now that's a God story. Thank you so much, God, for your story in our lives. Thank you for speaking to six-year-olds. Thank you for speaking to 90-year-olds who are passing into heaven. Thank you for the artists of this world. Bless the artists. Help our Christian faith to embrace artists more. Lord, thank you that you're the greatest artist of all time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath.
Church, will you bow your head with me and let's pray. Creator God, we give you thanks that you allow us to build our lives upon your love. Father God, we give you thanks for being that firm foundation in our lives. We give you these things in your precious son's name and we pray, amen. Well, thank you so, so much for joining us for worship today. If you are interested in partnering, partnering with us here at the church, check out this QR code here on your screen. Click the link below and get started and know that you are loved by a God of grace. And we cannot wait to see you right back here next week for worship. See you soon.